Hi, this is Nancy Herald, and welcome to my show, High Road to Humanity. In every episode, I tell you powerful true stories filled with great wisdom that you can use in your own life as you strive for a higher road to travel. My featured guests will have their own unique stories to tell that enlighten your mind and your soul. So kick back, relax, and learn the secret to success when you take the high road. Hi, this is Nancy Yerald, and welcome to High Road to Humanity. And I have Lisa Thompson here today. And welcome to High Road to Humanity, Lisa. Thank you, Nancy. It's great to be here. Thank it's you a that. pleasure yeah, to have you. You guys, she's written this book. I'm going to have her hold it up for you. It's called Finding Elevation. Yes. Here we it's go, pretty, right here. It's a beautiful cover. Which Thank mountain you. is that, by the so way? This was taken, this photo was taken in 2015. Right. On a mountain in Nepal called Manaslu. Nice. Very yeah. nice. Well, I'm going to read a little bit about you, but then I want you to tell the audience your story. So... Lisa Thompson is a mountaineer. She's a cancer survivor, and she's a sought-after speaker and coach. She's uh, growing up in the flat, humid farmlands of Illinois. She relied on adventure as a distraction, always knowing that she'd someday leave her hometown for something bigger, and she has. So she became the first person in her extended family to graduate from college, and she worked for 20 years as an engineer and in leadership roles. Uh, at technology companies. And I'm just going to kind of stop it there. I want you to tell your story because I grew up in Ohio and Michigan and it's flat. <laughs> There's soybeans and corn. That's, <laughs> it. That's it. So I just I just think this is really cool. Hopefully I'm not too loud on my uh, microphone today. I'll turn that down a little bit. But um, tell us your story. How did you start climbing mountains? I, I, this yeah. is really cool. Well, like you said, it was it was not a part of my childhood. Right. Um, I would even go as far as to say that I, w- I wasn't athletic as a kid at all. You know, I like maybe made the volleyball team one year in my tiny little town where they were like, you know, more just one more person trying out than was needed for the team. <laughs> so okay. I, was not, I was not athletic. Um, climbing wasn't something that I aspired to do. And you mentioned the Midwest and I laugh now because the highest point in my home state of Illinois is something like 1200 feet. And it's so, that's such a big deal that it has a name. (laughs) So it was just, you know, flat (laughs) soy, soybeans, cornfields. Um, and, and that to me now to go back there, it actually feels very like comforting to be in that kind of an environment, but it did not lead to climbing at all. Um, that was sparked many years later when I moved to Seattle from the Midwest. Okay. And Seattle's where I live today. And here, climbing is a big part of the culture. You know, it's we're fortunate to have multiple mountain ranges nearby. And it's just, you know, something that people like spend their weekends doing, exploring mm-hmm. in the mountains. And so I had moved here for a job. Um, okay. This was one of was my second job out of college. Uh, I studied engineering and this was to be my first sort of management position, like taking on bigger roles and yeah. um, not quite yet managing people, but close. And I was the only woman at my level for the company that I worked at. And so my peers would often go climbing on the weekends and when they came back to the office oh. on Monday morning, they had these you know, stories about being on rope teams and trying to figure out how to navigate together and managing through snowstorms. And I honestly wanted none of that. That didn't interest me at all. But what I saw was this just really strong sense of camaraderie between those men. And I wanted to be a part of that because I thought that it would allow me to be seen, to be seen in the office and to be okay. considered capable um, amongst my peers. And so instead of doing what would be like, you know, the logical thing, like raise my hand and say, that sounds really cool. Can I come with you? Yeah. <laughs> I just got frustrated and I just decided I would go climbing on my own, oh. not knowing, you know, and, and at that point it was, it was hiking, um, but just exploring in the mountains near my home in Seattle, not knowing like anything about what I was getting into or what I was doing. And right. eventually, I signed up with a local guide company to attempt to summit Mount Rainier 
which is the highest point in Washington state. And big deal that I was hooked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw now at one point you do hire a guide. Is that yeah. what, or so, so that was after. Oh, at many points. I like I had, um, okay. all of my, most of my climbs have been with a guide company. Okay. It's not been until very recently that I've had, you know, the right network and the skill and experience to do things on my own. I did work with a coach as well. I worked with a climbing coach. Yes. Um, I read right. that, that you did. Yeah. So that was a big Scott one. Johnston, I guess. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Well, I really give you credit because I'm from New Mexico. Well, originally Ohio, Michigan, like you flat and then went to New Mexico. Now we do, and then here I am in Arizona. Now we do hike and there's so many trails. I got to tell you, I went out this yes. morning, you know, uh -huh. and I, that's one of my goals is to get out in the morning and just go. Awesome. And um, so it's, and it, you know, you feel better. You just, I want to oh. say this, first of all, what I thought you were going to say when you were telling the story about the guys is that they came in with a better attitude. <laughs> But, no, no. <laughs> I love I, that. Oh my I, god! I, don't, I think I mean they were certainly excited about the adventures that they had experienced and about what they had overcome as a team. Right. Um, and that was really what that's what I wanted to be a part of. Right. Well, what did they say when you start doing this? So I, know, I didn't tell them. I was still super shy. Like, oh. not, you know, didn't want to stand out. Didn't, I I didn't, it was just this, I think a lot of women feel this way where you want so badly to be a part of something and you can see it, but I lacked the confidence um, and the self-awareness even at that point to, to expose what I was doing. So I did like, I didn't even tell them at all. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, but this did change you because look at you today, here you are talking to me on a podcast yeah. you've written a book you know I mean my goodness it did change you it made you more confident absolutely it did yeah that's really I, cool I say you know even this is true even today when yeah. I'm in the mountains that I learn more and more about myself and about what I'm capable of and about what's important to me and so mountains really have become my greatest teachers yeah. And I wanted to say throughout the book, you know, she tells about all these different, she tells a lot of stories and different mountains that you've climbed and, you know, you've even, um, you've gone to Mount Everest, which I think is fabulous. Um, you've climbed all these different places and you said that climbing gave you the strength to even beat cancer. And I want you to talk about that because you were diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015. Mm -hmm. And so talk, do you mind telling this part no. of the story? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yep. So I, at that point was 42 years old. Okay. Um, I considered and still consider myself an athlete. I thought, you know, it was not at all within my, what I thought was my realm of possibility that I could be diagnosed with any illness, let alone cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, vividly remember, um, it was a February morning and I had a, a routine mammogram scheduled. It was only the second one I'd ever had. Um, and I remember being annoyed, honestly, at this, I, know, like, I read this. <laughs> like, uh, like I have the stack of work to do and I have to go have this dumb test taken. And, right. you know, looking back, that was all just a sign that I needed to just slow down and listen to my body and mm -hmm. pay more attention. Um, and so I, I knew because I worked in, uh, medical technology for m most of my career, even at that point, I knew kind of the flow of medical imaging. And I, I knew that when the radiologist walked back into the room after my test, that it was abnormal, that something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, just, it's so hard to describe where your mind goes. Like, you know, you're in some sort of survival mechanism for sure. And as you know, the words are coming out of her mouth and she's explaining what she saw and it's still not a diagnosis, right? She couldn't, as the radiologist diagnose that I had cancer, but she just was sharing these concerning spots that she saw on my mammogram. And I knew, I knew instantly that I had cancer. There was just this yeah. like, awareness that you felt it for me I felt it absolutely felt it and I you know got I like kept it together for you know because I didn't want this doctor to think I was like a weakling which is absurd but right um got back in my car and just 
broke down driving mm. all the way back to the office and then just, you know, wipe the tears and snot off my face and just walked back into the office like nothing had changed, which um, I did many times throughout my treatment, which is not advisable at all. Um, but it was what got me through it. And it was definitely, you know, today, today I can be grateful for cancer, to cancer, for what it gave me and what it showed me and the way that it helped me reprioritize my life. Mm -hmm. In that moment, I could have never, it took me years um, to be able to like, look back and really think about things and analyze how I've grown and changed since that day in 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, But I realized that it, it really was this teacher again, that forced me to stop and think about how I was spending my time, who I was spending it with, where I was putting my energy what my priorities were. And, you know, it caused me to reorder just about everything in my life and to really start to focus on climbing more seriously, because I even then knew that the mountains were just this incredible resource for me, this incredible sort of partner. And it helped, they helped me feel like I am who I am. And like I said, they've taught me just an abundance of things and continue to. You know, like they taught you the energy made you feel like you belonged yes. somewhere. That's Very what I feel. Funny. Yeah. I you went somewhere where you were part of it. Yeah, that's really cool. When you go out in nature, it changes everything. I was just telling you before the show, you know, I God gave me this place that I live in now. I just moved and I have the ability to get up and walk outside and take a little hike in the morning. And I haven't been doing it. Uh. You know. And so today I'm like, I'm getting up and going, well, you know, you start to unpack boxes and your back hurts and then you're tired and you don't want to go. And I mean, it, it's, it's hard. Like you were just saying to think you really ought to take care of yourself. And I made a pact. I'm like, I'm going to get up and walk every single day, you know, because you feel different. And that's why I'm bringing it up because when you're out in the trees and you're out with nature and you're yes. out in the mountains it's a different feeling. It's a different energy. Talk about that. It's so healing for me too. And when I was going through cancer treatment, it was, and I know there's data that supports this. I couldn't cite it today, but you know, there's many people who have just found this incredible healing element by being in nature. And it, Mm -hmm. it also, especially, so I'm very used to being in nature with a specific goal, right? Like I'm going to run X number of miles. I'm going to gain X amount of feet of elevation today. Um, I'm going to climb this mountain. I'm going to carry this much weight in my backpack. So I was very used to being in nature in a very, in a goal oriented sense. Right. And when I was going through treatment, I couldn't do any of that. And it, it hurt my ego a lot those first few days, because I was determined yeah. You know, if, if anyone's had breast cancer, you leave with these, you know, sort of bulbs that collect fluid that's still, you know, your body's still excreting. And so I would shove those in the the back of my yoga pants and I would go for a walk. And if, if runners passed me, like my ego wanted to be like, I can run too, like I promise. It's just like this. Oh my gosh. But it forced me to slow down mm-hmm. and to look at nature differently and to really just be quiet and listen and absorb it and let it start that process of healing. And so it it I'm so happy to hear that you're doing that on a daily basis now because I'm forcing just, myself. Yeah, because yeah. you have to because yes. and then I got out there just to be I mean honestly I get out there then there's all kinds of other people out there and it's early. I mean it's like 8 30 you know and everybody's and it's cold. It's not that warm. <laughs> but but there's other people out there doing the same thing. And then you're like oh look I'm not the only one. And then you start to feel good, you know, like you were talking, you know, but um, Absolutely. I just, you know, so you did have, and I don't want to get into too much of detail. It's up to you, but you did have a mastectomy and you didn't have reconstructive surgery. Have a little bit about that. Cause I think women want to hear. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's so many, I think anytime there's, you know, you're faced with this illness, or any illness, it's, you're just, you feel so ill-equipped to navigate that. Like, no, no, you don't practice it, right? No, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. It's hard to find allies that are going to be strong with you and for you and honest with you. 
And I really treated beating cancer like a project because that's all that I knew how to do. That made sense to me. Like, okay, we have this project now. I'm going to beat cancer. I'm going to build a really strong team of people. We're all 100% dedicated to this goal. And you have to be strong. And if you're not, then you can't be on the team. And that was wow. really that was how I needed to structure it in that yeah. moment. And I might do it different today, but you're faced with all these like seemingly excruciating decisions. So I had cancer. I had tumors in my left breast and some concerning calcifications in my right breast. Oh, wow. And I had to decide if I wanted to keep my, my right breast or not, which is like a decision that you never think you're going to have to make. Um, and ultimately decided that it was just too risky to, to keep them both. And so right. I had a bilateral mastectomy. Oh, you did. Okay. And then there's all these other decisions. Like, do you want to keep your nipples? Yes or no. <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's, it was very overwhelming to, to navigate all of that. And I will forever be grateful to my medical team and to the people who were, you know, friends who helped me just take the time I needed and be vulnerable yeah. and make the right decisions for me. And I don't, you know, there were people um, who thought that that was a very radical decision to have a bilateral mastectomy and it just felt right for me. Mm -hmm. And just two weeks ago, there was a study which says that, you know, you're, you know, the percentage of you getting cancer again and the, the breast that's left is very, very high. So I feel like I'm made the right decision for mm -hmm. me yeah um but it was definitely it was something I was underprepared for and just had to navigate sometimes second by second well how can you be prepared for something yeah. like that I mean yep. but I will say it feels like your climbing um gave you I don't know just the backbone you know how you approached it in your business and everything kind of gave you that backbone to overcome it. Like you were determined. I could see the determination in your face. You're like, I am not going to let this beat me. And you didn't. And God yeah. bless. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, how was your, go ahead. Oh, I, I, I used to say that I, I didn't. And, and now this is maybe a little bit absurd, but it was what I needed in the moment that I, I didn't want cancer to dictate my priorities. I didn't, yeah. you feel like, I felt like my body had started to betray me. Like we had been best of friends for 42 years. And all of a sudden these cells just started to not, not follow the plan that we had all agreed we were going to follow <laughs> together. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just didn't want cancer to, to dictate what my priorities were. And so I wanted, I still wanted to climb that fall. Um, and my, my oncology surgeon and I, we laugh about it today. Like, you know, this, this meeting she and I had where she was like, you, you know, you just might not be able to go to go to do this climb. And like, I understand how important it is to you, but you have to listen to your body and give it time to heal. And I totally remember saying like, can't we just postpone this whole cancer thing for like six, like, what's the big deal? Like, we'll just, I'll come back. I'll go climb. I'll come back. Then we'll take care of it. Um, and she, you know, in her, you know, very compassionate, understanding, loving way said that would be foolhardy. I remember her using that word. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and of course she was right. And, you know, I took the time you, so you mentioned reconstruction. So I, um, because I still wanted to be able to climb in Nepal that same year, I had a bilateral mastectomy in April and then postponed reconstruction. And so oh. after that climb, um, until I got back in, in November of that same year. Well, that's interesting. That you, that was cool that you could do that, actually. Yeah, it was really nice, and I, 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 you know, aside from just wanting to climb, it sort of gave me time, I think, to accept the changes in my body, kind of, you know, one piece or one step at a time. Mm -hmm. um, well, my, yeah, because energetically, you're oh removing gosh. a. I mean, just I, I'm into energy. And yes. so I'm thinking as you're doing this, you're removing a part of your body. So you almost have to like yes. mourn that part yes. that's got. Yeah, yes. I would think. I don't know. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, and I at the time, you know, I had friends who were like, don't you feel like you're losing part of what makes you a woman? And, and I had like my relationship with my breast sort of instantly changed to you're not my friends anymore and you have to go. Oh. Um. And so I, I think 
that was a survival mechanism, obviously. Yeah, yeah I laugh because it sounds funny now. <laughs> it, right. But you that's know. what I needed to do. That's what I needed to just to get mm-hmm. through it and to make those decisions. And then came the morning and then came the like, you know, this was a part of my, a part of who I am, who I've always been. And it, you know, it, it, it had to go. It just, we weren't on the same team anymore. Um, and so to see my body without breasts was very difficult, you know, and I understand like how that is so much a part of what we define as being a woman. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, didn't, didn't feel that when I didn't have breasts and I wish that wasn't true. I so wish that wasn't true culturally. Um, I agree with that to me. Yeah, I agree. Well, and that's what we're trying to get to. That's why I do the show so that people realize that it's the inside of you. That's the, the treasure, the treasure lies within yes. the treasure is not on the outside. It's within, I think as we get older, we realize more and more, you know, that the treasure lies within, you know, you did a journal. I journal every day. So when I saw yeah. you journal, I was like, Oh, cool. She journals. So did you start journaling? Like when you started uh, climbing or is that I what you did? Started when I had cancer, okay. I had maybe dabbled on and off, um, had always relied on journaling. If I was going through something difficult, it's really, you know, very writing is a very important, like cathartic mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. And so when I had cancer was when I really just, you know, in earnest multiple times a day um, would just start, like if I needed to process something, that was how I did it. And that was the beginning of finding elevation. That was the beginning of my memoir where those, you know, early journals is for your book. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that interesting how that worked yes. out? Yeah. Yes. I went through a divorce a couple of years ago and I had been journaling, but I really got into the practice where I did my prayer, my meditation and my journal every day. Yep. And now I do it. It's the best thing in the world. It's just like you said, you just get all that stuff in your head. You know, you wake up in the morning and you got all this stuff in your head. I get it all out on paper and I journal to God. I'm like, and to goddess, I've added the goddess. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, I, turn, I journal to both of them every day, but let's go back a little bit to what you were saying about how we define ourselves. You know, this is real. I mean, this is yeah. real life and this happens to a lot of people and our society has made it really difficult to just have these things happen and then try to fit back in. And I, I don't know, I, I hope was that, go ahead. What are you thinking? No, I did. I was, I, yeah, please continue. <laughs> well, like, no, that's what I see. It's a horrible thing because yes. we, we're human beings. We're energetic souls. We're in these bodies, you know, we're only here for a certain amount of time. And these things happen to people. And, you know, we have, like I said, I mean, how would you ever met somebody that they were so wonderful and so such a beautiful soul that you don't even remember what they look like? Oh, Yeah. Because you just feel that energetic connection to them. And that's where I would like to see. That's where we're going. I would like to see us get there a little quicker. Because I can just <laughs> yeah. tell that this has really been something that's been hard, difficult. for Well, for, for anybody. Sure. It would yeah. be difficult for anybody to go yeah. through, you know? And I, I think you're right that we're, I was, you know, raised in the Midwest like you. Mm-hmm. Um, hardworking, you know second third generation family and we were taught to just like chin up and keep Buck it up yeah like dust the dirt off and keep going yeah I, I totally remember my grandmother telling me that and so that you know back to like survival mechanisms like that was a lot of what I had to do when I had cancer and I was laughing earlier because I remember having an MRI biopsy like literally having my breast punctured Mm. putting ice packs in my bra and going back to the office for a board meeting why would you do that oh my god (laughs) today I would not do that but at the time I part of it felt like I just needed to be tough like I couldn't I wasn't gonna let cancer stop me Mm -hmm. and I didn't want at that point I didn't want people at the office to know that I had cancer because again I you know it was a very male dominated environment and I thought that I would be seen as weak isn't that sad because yeah. I get that completely. I because then you're you're like you feel like you're less than or something. Right. Or you have this, you know, this is a woman problem. And like, and some of that is very self-inflicted. I mm-hmm. I think at that point in my career, I would have gotten a lot of support, but I just wasn't yet ready to ask for it. Yeah, you weren't there yet. Yep. So 
let's rewind a little bit. You've done all these climbs and in the book, she has pictures. It's really cool. And you have a lot of the mountains that you climb. Let's talk about your family a little bit. What's your family? Did they come and visit? Did they support? Did they come to Seattle? I know you're really close to your dad. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to so, talk about that a little bit. <laughs> so they, um, you know, my family has rarely left the Midwest. Mm. Um, I think still my, my sisters maybe been to Canada, but like never really left the U S even. Yeah. And so it was very hard for them to wrap their brains around why I would do this. And, and, you know, the, this meaning the whole thing from like traveling to a third world country as a woman, often by myself to, you know, climbing these incredibly dangerous mountains and they were excited, like cautiously excited and supportive, but, but never really understood. Um, Wow. And I, I really tried to when I just made the decision to climb K2, which is a much more dangerous mountain even than Everest. So K2 is the second highest mountain in the world and it's in Pakistan and has a much higher death rate. Like one in four people um, generally don't make it from that. Were you ever afraid? Can I just, I'm going to stop you. Were you ever afraid that like maybe you weren't going to make it? Yes. Yes. And that before okay. I left for Everest, I, I wasn't as afraid, but before I left for K2, I actually wrote a note like, and I put it right here at this desk under my keyboard uh, for my sister in case oh I God. didn't make it. So I, you know, and I think you, you know, there's a whole nother episode about the psychology of climbers and why we take those kinds of risks. But I think you have to accept that first you have to understand, you have to, you know, do the, the work to understand what the risks of any mountain are. And to assess those risks against your skills and abilities, and also against what you're willing to accept. And you have to, I think in the case of K2 and other dangerous mountains, you have to accept that a possible outcome is that you're not going to make it. What's it feel Um, like when you get up there and you make it? What's it feel like? Yeah, I I don't think you make it until you're back at base camp. Okay. Okay. I yeah. Could you climb down? You right. talk about that where you had to like go around this guy. Yeah. 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 There was a point on K2 talk about that. Yeah. Where, um, so I had summited and I, and on the summit, I have a pretty strict, like no celebrating rule because it's only halfway. A very famous climber said that once, like that it's only halfway and most climbing accidents happen on the descent. They don't happen when you're going up. Um, so I knew all of that and I had just summited and I was at about, so the, the summit is 28,251 feet and I was at probably 27,000 feet, um, descending, you know, there's plenty of people around, but I was basically by myself Mm -hmm. and I was on the precipice of a, a wall of steep ice that was below me. And the way that that route is set up there two ropes attached to the mountain. One is for climbers who are climbing up and one is for climbers like me who are going down. And someone had started climbing up the rope that I needed to attach myself to, to go down. Okay. And he was also like not responsive. He he was fine and he survived. He's totally fine, but he was laying on the ice and I, you know, so I'm yelling at him, like not saying nice things to try to get him to move. And he's totally not responding. And I realized that I can either stand there and wait for him to decide that he wants to climb again. And was he just frozen? Like, was he just afraid? Was it a fear thing or what was it? He was tired. Uh, You know, he was hypoxic. So he wasn't getting oxygen as we all were. And I think just beyond his limit, his capabilities. Right. And so he was, you know, essentially taking a break, but he had. I think lost a little bit of consciousness and not able to respond to what anyone was saying around him. Wow. That's Um, crazy scary. It was super scary. And it it also happened in one of like, because I'm a nerd about mountains, I know that this is a spot on the mountain that's very deadly. And so if I fell, I I would, I would die. And I, I recognized that I knew that. And I had to like perform these very delicate moves once I repelled down to him and then would anchor myself to the ice 
move around him a little bit, move my anchor, move past him. And, you know, had to do that three or four times while, while knowing that, I mean, literally any mistake that I made, um, would, would probably result in my death. And so it's just, I think that's why, you know, climbing is one of those things that I like. I like that sense of like extreme focus. Like I cannot make a mistake in this moment Mm -hmm. and I have to keep myself together enough to think clearly, you know, watch what I'm doing and maneuver just without any exception perfectly in order to survive. And in the end, that makes you feel very like alive and accomplished that you've done that thing. Yeah. And that's, that's a feeling that no one can take away from you. Interesting. Really interesting. It's really made you confident. I can tell. And you're very strategic. Of course, you're an engineer anyway. My father was an engineer. So very methodical. Engineers yes. are very methodical. Yes. I could see that. Now this makes a whole lot of sense. Now that it's coming together. How yes. you would do that? No, did the guy? Okay, so you went around him. Obviously, you were okay. I mean, were you like, what do you do about somebody else who's like, you know, they're kind of not with the program? I mean, do you yeah. send up help when you get down? How do you handle that? I mean, I'm just curious at, as we're discussing this. It's so, th- there are a lot of, you know, ethics that come into play on a mountain. Okay. And there are a lot of, and it's, it's a hundred percent personal, right? There's no like rule or law or guideline about what you yeah. do up there. Right. Um, on that same, so that man was fine. I, you know, he was able to say a few words to me and he, I told him he should turn around and he said he was going to the summit. And I thought like, you know, that's your choice. Um, and he was fine. He actually summited and made it down safely. <laughs> By the um, grace of God. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. sure. yeah. Um, but there was another point on that climb when we were ascending and one of my team members, his oxygen, the, the regulator for his oxygen bottle broke and, you know, without it, you're screwed. And, uh, we were climbing together and he realizes it's not working and we stop and he, he thinks he has a backup in his backpack and he digs around and this is at you know, again, probably 26,000 feet, 27,000 feet. Wow. Um, it's barely light out in the morning. And I radio ahead to see if anyone has a spare regulator on the team. And because of just the, the terrain, no, I was kind of around the corner from the rest of the team and no one could hear me on the radios that we had. Okay. Um, and so he, he is a very crafty man and like, you know, duct tape and bailing wire figured this thing out. And, and he told me to leave him. He's like, I was like, can I, like, there was literally nothing I could do to help him besides giving him my oxygen, which just moves the problem from one person to the other. Yeah. Um, and I just remember that moment of like, I have to leave him here. And, and I didn't know in my heart if that was the right thing to do, Mm -hmm. but I also couldn't come up with another solution that was better for both of us. Yeah. You got to save yourself. It comes down to that, doesn't it? It's interesting as you're telling me this, I'm thinking, okay, so you need to go with a group. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be by yourself. You want to make sure there's other people, but then you did go by yourself at different times. Yes. It's a, it is. So you are there as a team. And I think on those big mountains, you, you need to still be self-sufficient. You need to still be able to make your own decisions and have the skills you need to ascend and descend safely. And often you are, you know, by yourself, you just get spread out by virtue of how fast you're climbing relative to the rest of your team. Um, And sometimes you're not in radio contact with them and, you know, you've got to. Buck it up. (laughs) Thanks, grandma. (laughs) Oh my gosh. You know, I want to talk about your dad a little bit because I, yeah. I wrote I wrote down this poem. Oh, yes. I'm going to read it today. Yeah, please do. It's a beautiful poem. Do you want to talk? Well, I'm going to read it. Should I read it first? Sure. Well, let me just say, you take it home with me because my father always read Reader's Digest. I didn't realize it was from Reader's Digest until I wrote Final elevation and I we searched back and and it was from Reader's Digest my yeah yeah, my dad yeah he always read it and it reminded me so much 
but you were very close to your father mm -hmm. and he had a battle with cancer himself he did and now i don't know when did he give this to you when you were a young girl he gave it to me when I was, I was probably 13. I was in that angsty period. My parents were divorced and I was like, I'm going to live oh. with my mom. Now I hate you. I'm going to go live with my dad. Now oh I'm my God. Dad. <laughs> so I was like, Back that. and forth. Yeah. Okay. And I think it was probably one of those times when I was mad at him because he like, wouldn't let me go to a dance or something. And I was yeah. thinking about, um, and he gave me that poem and I kept it. I still have it like in my desk drawer. I kept it with me. I cried this morning when I, I was reading this and I cried. I want to read it to you guys. So sit back and relax. This is <laughs> what our dad gave her and she kept. He said, or it says, I am always here to understand you. I am always here to laugh with you. I'm always here to cry with you. I'm always here to talk to you. I'm always here to think with you. I'm always here to plan with you. And even though we may not always be together, please know that I'm always here to love you. That's so wonderful. I mean, what? So beautiful. I mean, that is just, that meant the world to you. Oh, it did. Yeah. I mean, it did. It still does. And I, 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 and I think it's interesting now to look back and like, I was, you know, mad at him and he gave me this really touching, meaningful. Yeah. Moment. And I, you know, at the time I knew what it touched me too, but I, you know, you're at that point in your life sure. and you don't want to admit that you, like, you have those kinds of feelings. Um, what do you think about you climbing? What do you think about you going and doing all this stuff? Yeah. He, similar to the rest of my family, he loved it. He thought, thought it was really cool. Yeah. Um, didn't understand it. He was very supportive of me and, um, he, he was diagnosed with lung cancer while I was climbing Everest. Oh. And I found out when I got back to Kathmandu, um, after my summit and, you know, that was, a. it's one thing when you have cancer and you're, you know, as much in the driver's seat as you can be, but it's a whole nother situation and strategy when it's someone you love that has cancer. Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard for me to, to, to let him define his own journey because I wanted him to like fight and like, you know, do all the things. And, and he, by the time you know, he was a very stubborn man. And by the time uh, he found out it spread to his brain and his spine, Oh no. Um, and so he, he died about, he died a month after I got back from Everest mm -hmm. and I'm actually sorry. read that poem at his funeral. <clears throat> that was how like I kept it that whole time. And it was really like a full circle moment to be able to go back and then read that at his funeral. Mm -hmm. But he was a very, he was very supportive of me. Um, and it was important to me before he died that he knew that I was going to attempt K2. Um, oh, wow which he, you know, really didn't appreciate the difficulty or the risk. And I don't know that I was really asking his permission, but I just wanted him to know that I just had like, there's just this one more mountain that I have left to climb. <laughs> um, and he, I think he got it. Like he understood I had one more thing to do. Right. He didn't fully appreciate how difficult and, and deadly that one last thing was though. Did he know about the book? No, he did not. He um, does now. He does now, <laughs> for sure. Um, I love it. Yeah. Talk I, about the book. What, 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 why did you decide to write it? Because I love it. I love Finding Elevation. I love the title. He did good. Fear and Courage on the World's Most Dangerous Mountain. Yeah, I. it's funny. So as you said, my education is in engineering, but even when I was young, I, I wanted to write and I would write, I don't know if your, your listeners remember those, um, choose your own adventure books. Like oh, yeah. I would read those when I was a kid and I, I would write those, and like make up my own adventure stories. And, nice. and I think there was, you know, my family encouraged me to, to study engineering or to study something that they felt I would be able to make a career out of. Mm -hmm. and writing was not one of those things mm -hmm. um and I understand where they were coming from in that but I always had this desire and there were multiple times in my 20s where I would like try to come up with a topic and it just nothing just really stuck until I had cancer 
And I sort of looked back at my relationship with climbing and with the mountains and these, you know, struggles and obstacles that I had encountered and, and overcome in some way. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that could be beneficial or inspirational or resonate with other people in a way that lifted them up. And then it became really important to me to tell that story and just to share in a way that hopefully resonates with other people and allows them to just take one more step forward towards your goal, whatever that is, um, to just find the strength and the motivation to do that. It's funny how we get older and we finally do what we always wanted to do. I always wanted to do this. See, here you are. Always, yeah. I told my mom and dad, I want to go to broadcasting school. And they hear you and being from the Midwest, they're like, oh, no, no, no. Exactly. That's how my parents were too. Yeah. They were so proud when I was a real estate broker. Yeah, my dad was very proud when I was an engineer and when I had you know, managed big teams. Um and and I I you're like, wait, wait, wait. So tell me about the book. Have you gotten, what has been the response since it's come out? It's to been, me. Yeah, so unexpectedly incredible. So it was published three weeks ago, January okay. 10th. Wow. Um, and it's hard to know what to expect. Like yeah. I'm still sort of waiting for a bad review to be oh, honest. No, like, don't like, say like, that. myself like it's gonna it's okay, it's gonna happen. But I, you know, every day get messages from people who say, I couldn't put this down. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, I'm inspired by what you've overcome. And I I want all women to know that they're capable. And that just like, like I did not expect that at all. I thought the book up again so people can see the cover. (laughs) I hate when I don't have it. It's a beautiful cover. Finding elevation. I love the title. I love the cover. I love that your I mean your heart's in it. I can tell as you read it, your heart is just in it. And it really is, you know, at its heart, it's a climbing memoir. So I I it will appeal to people. I've had climbing friends who who it resonates with because of the detail about climbing certain mountains, but you know, there is this underlying really deep and personal story about finding my own voice and finding what I'm capable of through those obstacles and through climbing. And that's really what I want readers to take from it. Congratulations. Thank you. I have to say it's been quite an accomplishment. So what's next before we get out of here today? What's next? Oh my gosh. So (laughs) I um, had the pleasure this past fall of co-leading an all women's expedition in Nepal. Oh, wow. Yeah, we, we climbed a 20,000 20, foot mountain called Cholatsi. And okay. a- along with a couple of other um, female friends who are climbers, we thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we had an all women's expedition? I'm actually looking. Here's a, a picture of us like at. Oh, wow. Gear. Look at um, that. There's a lot of you. Ten yeah. Of you? So it yeah. was really important to us that we climb solely as women. So all of our support team was female and we very intentionally invited women who were curious about learning how to work in the mountains. Mm -hmm. And many of them had had some sort of hardship that, that led them to climbing. So maybe one woman's husband had died while climbing Everest as a guide. Oh, wow. Um, Another woman's husband was a porter and got sick and she needed to then make money and so, you know, in Nepal, women aren't often educated. They're, you know, not expected to work. It's changing, but but we wanted to employ these women to give them a skill and to also just create this really cool environment of climbing with an all women's team. And so that's neat. It was so rewarding. We raised money for girls' education. So provided four years of education for 18 girls in Nepal. Wow. And that that is what I will do more of. So coming soon, um, there will be more all women's expeditions that have some sort of philanthropic intent to them because it was just so cool. That is so cool. Thank you. I want to say one more thing before we get out of here too. You've been, there was an Emmy nominated documentary Yes, that debuted in May of 2017. And I should have brought that up. Talk about that for a second. Yeah, totally unexpected. So the name of the virtual reality series is 
is called Capturing Everest. Okay. And so the year that I climbed Everest, um, my team was capturing all this virtual reality footage of our climb. And nice. that later was bought by Sports Illustrated and turned into Capturing Everest, which won an Emmy that the following year, 2017. Um, wow. So, so it's a very, <laughs> I wonder what the guys at work think now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I never in a million years thought I would have an Emmy ever. Um, I it. I think it's amazing. It's not for my acting ability, I can assure you. <laughs> I think it's great. Now, are you still an engineer? I don't. I left the corporate environment several years ago. Okay. Um, but, you know, for most of my career was in some sort of technical leadership role right. where I, you know, after I stopped and I never really like designed or did anything, you know, any heavy engineering. Um, but I was always in some sort of technical role when mm -hmm. I was in a corporate world. Yeah. But you don't miss it, do you? Oh, no. I can tell. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm over it. I'm over it. Yeah. Oh, and my it God. just wasn't for me. Like, it just, you know, I did it for 20 plus years, uh, which is a really good run. And um, I'm just so much happier and so much more myself now than I was mm -hmm. in that environment. You, yeah, you're doing it because you love it. How do people yes. contact you? Do you have a website? Yeah, or? you can check me out on lisaclimbs.com. Nice. Um, or on Instagram, which is the same handle, Lisa Climbs. Okay. And I'd love to hear from people. It, it really means a lot to me to know what you think of Finding Elevation. And if you're curious about starting to, to climb or have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out lisaclimbs.com i love it thanks for coming on and telling your story thanks it's been me. quite it's a pleasure fun. yeah yes. thank, thank you. you i really appreciate it you guys got to get out of here for today if you want an intuitive reading if you want me to bring you some messages go to my website nancyyearout.com and book your date and time got to get out of here for today but again remember it's called finding elevation with lisa thompson all right you guys this is nancy you this is high road to humanity Everybody take care and God bless.